Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Can you guess what I'm going to say first? I bet you can. If you're a regular listener, you will know that this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. A-A-S-A. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is a membership organisation for animal studies scholars in Australia, in New Zealand, but also around the world. We've got members of ASA from all around the world. Membership is just 50 Australian dollars. I'm a member of ASA. I really encourage you to think about becoming a member as well. That's ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, if you're a regular listener, you'll also know that recently we've had a second sponsor for Knowing Animals, and that's MC Pony. MC Pony is a hip-hop artist, a musician, a songwriter, and a passionate animal advocate. She is making tunes for people to enjoy, particularly if they've got an interest in animal issues. So if you've not checked out MC Pony's work yet, you should. She's on YouTube, she's got a website, she's got a Facebook page. Everything you need to know about MC Pony is in the notes for this episode. So check out her music and uh, enjoy. Okay, let's get down to the business of the day. Once again, we're in Barcelona this week. We're in the beautiful city of Barcelona, of course, in Spain. The sun is shining. The weather is absolutely spectacular. I'm so pleased to be here. And this week, I'm joined by Dr. Ezzy Pease. Now, we were just talking before and I, t- I, I disclosed that I have some kind of inability to say people's names. So, would you like to jump in and correct me? Well, it's just Ethepaith. So Ethepaith. Almost correct. <laughs> almost correct. So, Ezzy is a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre for Ethics, Politics and Society at the University of Minho, which is in Braga, which of course is also in Portugal. But in addition to that, he's a board member of the Centre for Animal Ethics at the University of Pompeii Fabria, which is in Spain. And today we're going to discuss his article on the importance of species for rule consequentialists, which will shortly appear in the journal Utili- Utilitas. Utilita- Have I got that right? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the podcast, Essie. Nice to be here, Siobhan. Okay. So why this article? What inspired it? Well, um, regarding this particular piece, uh, I was struggling to find something meaningful to write about non-human animals when my friend and animal scholar Oscar Orta, which I think you've met already, uh, pointed out to me that there was this recent article on rural consequentialism and non-human animals by a Portuguese scholar called Pedro Galvao. And in that article, he, he, he argues that uh, on rural consequentialism, non-human animals don't have rights and that there are important cases in which uh, we are required not to help wild animals suffering from non-anthropogenic causes. And so I thought that was wrong, and um, I also thought it would be very interesting to show compellingly how animals would be protected by rights, even on a consequentialist view. I thought it was also an invaluable opportunity to write about wild animals who are usually neglected even by animal scholars. So I read your article and I very much enjoyed it. But as I mentioned to you before, I I did find it a little bit complicated. I had to try and click on my philosopher's brain. But I am going to need you to talk me through a few of these issues. And I suspect that while you're helping me understand it, our audience will also appreciate it. So can you start by telling us what rural consequentialism is? Yeah, rural rural consequentialism is that uh, view on in uh, normative ethics which tells us that an act is morally wrong if it would be d- disallowed by the dispositions that if everyone share would produce the best possible outcome so it, it shares with with all the consequentialist views the the notion that what uh, uh, morality 
is about is to bring about the best possible outcome to 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 create the best uh, possible world but unlike act consequentialism it doesn't make the rightness or wrongness of an action uh, depend on whether that particular action is optimistic or not whether that particular action brings about or not the best possible outcome it makes it depend on uh, what generally sh what generally shared dispositions would be the ones that would bring about that um, best possible outcome so so we may we we may ask, what would the world be like if we all shared a strong disposition against harming other people or against harming non-human animals? Um, so the, 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 the actions that would be d disallowed by those dispositions are the ones we should consider morally wrong. And so that then is the blending of the consequentialism. So we're looking to generate acts or outcomes that we think are beneficial or moral. And the rule bit is about deciding on particular behaviours that we think are morally acceptable. Yeah, the rule, the rule, uh, rule um, those who advocate for rule, uh, co rule consequentialism believe that um, morality has to do with with what we generally can ask of uh, each other it it that it doesn't have directly to do with what would bring about the best outcome but what can we ask of each other in order to bring about the best outcome and they cash it out and like other moral theories in terms what are the dispositions that if we all shared would bring about that that outcome it is those dispositions which give us the criterion of moral rightness and moral wrongness. So in your article, you're responding to Pedro Cavell, whose name I probably also mispronounced. <laughs> Can you start by telling us what his argument was? Yeah. So, of course, he, 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 he's asking, uh, what do we owe to animals on the best version of rule, of rule consequentialism? And he says, well... Um, the main the, the main grounds for uh, recognizing rights to uh, other individuals in a rule consequentialist moral moral code is the negative consequences that is the negative consequences that that would ensue if we if we didn't and and he ties those uh, consequences to the motivational limitations of human beings human human beings are not impartial agents. Uh, Human beings have a strong dispositions to partiality towards themselves, towards others uh, with whom they have meaningful relations. Not not only that, but uh, being partial to others, uh, to our friends, to our loved ones, is also a great source of happiness or a great a great uh, an important constituent of our of 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 our well being. So, a code that asked human beings to act impartially and to be happy with others acting impartially towards them would be asking too much motivationally motivationally for human beings humans human beings would constantly be afraid that others may harm them because they uh, believe that in that particular instance harming them is what maximizes the good they would also be afraid of the loved ones being being harmed for that reason so uh, in in order to forestall those negative consequences, which which would clearly not bring about the best possible world, what rule, what, uh, rule consequentialism typically tells us is, on the ideal moral code, uh, important human interests would be protected by rights. So constraints against maximizing the good. When people have a strong disposition not to harm others, except in very exceptional circumstances where there is compelling evidence that would really maximize the good. That, that's what the ideal moral code would look like. But, of course, non-human animals cannot be aware that those are the general dispositions shared by in human societies. So they cannot be afraid at the expectation that others may harm them in order to maximize the good. So these negative consequences are not present 
regarding non-human animals. And that is the standard argument why, on rule consequentialism, animals would not be protected by rights, but human beings would be. And that is what I try to dispute in my article. Mm. So, just to clarify, was Pedro Gavel's argument pro-animal in any way, shape or form, or was it very much a human-centred argument? No, it was pro-animal uh, in the sense that since non-human animals are sentient beings, uh, their interest must be protected on the ideal moral code, but they are not protected by rights. So what the ideal moral code uh, tells human agents is that they should have, they, they have a prima facie duty not to harm non-human animals, and they have a, pr a prima facie duty to help them. That means, uh, in Galvao's terms, that unless they have evidence that harming animals is what maximizes the good, we, should, we shouldn't do that. And unless we have evidence that helping some non-human animal uh, would not maximize the good, we should help them. But so there our treatment of non of non uh, human interests is directly consequentialists. We must harm them or uh, avoid to harm them depending on on what is optimistic. So in short, on this model, it's better to be human than to be a non-human. Well, certainly human interests are uh, protected by uh, more more strongly than non-human interests, mm -hmm. yes. So, what was your objection to that argument? My main objection uh, was that, though it is true that uh, these uh, motivational facts about human beings are important, and that they give us reasons to conclude that on the ideal rule, consequentialist code, their interests would be protected by rights, there are other facts about the psychology of human agents that, that have to do with how epistemically limited we are that give us additional grounds to uh, um, establish constraints uh, uh, to optimistic actions and that those constraints also cover, also protect the interests of uh, non-human animals. So, um, uh, Let me give you an example about this. Suppose that we had a community of impartial moral agents, agents who are motivated only to do what is impartially best, but at the same time that these agents had epistemic limitations similar to the ones we have, so they have to decide, lacking part of the relevant info information, they make mistakes when uh, uh, deliberating morally. If we are, if we reflect on what the, ide what the ideal moral code would be for these agents, I think that we would recognize that it would not be optimistic just to tell them just maximize the, 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 the good because they would make mistakes regarding that. So you must establish rules that avoid possible mistakes they, they would be making. We would tell them, well, um, even if you consider that harming someone would maximize the good, since you might be mistaken regarding that. Only harm other people when the good you would produce is tremendously high. And that is what a constraint looks like. That is what a right looks like. So, so that, that, that is my argument for concluding that even uh, that, 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 that on rule consequentialism, even non-human animals would also be protected by rights because they are subject to the same epistemic m mistakes we can make re regarding human beings. Now, you also bring wildlife into the discussion. Yes. Can you explain the role wildlife and thinking about free-living animals plays in your argument? Yes. Um, in, his, in his paper, Galvao claimed that we have a duty, a prima facie duty, to help wild animals suffering from anthropogenic causes and some uh, natural causes, uh, but that we have a duty not to help them when that would cause another wild animal some harm, even if the harm 
the animal would suffer is less severe than the, that the, that the one we are trying to prevent to another animal with our intervention. And I thought that that was odd, because how can it be wrong to help someone even if you are harming another one, when the harm you are averting is worse than the harm you are thereby causing. Um, so I tried to explain how um, uh, that on that arrangement would not be optimistic from a rule consequentialist point of view. And the main reason is that, first, most sentient beings, so most of the individuals who would be covered by the ideal moral code, are free-living, non-human animals. 99.999% of all sentient individuals are non-humans living in nature. Not human beings, not uh, non-human animals under human control. And second, we have compelling evidence that the overwhelming majority of free-living wild animals have lives in which suffering prevails due to natural causes, not anthropogenic causes. So if that is true in moral terms, what happens with non-human lives in nature is a catastrophe. If rule consequentialism has, has uh, to do with what we are morally required to do in order to bring about the best possible outcome, certainly one of the uh, moral problems to which we should assign the greatest priority is ameliorating the situation of wild animals. So I, I, I argue plausibly what rule consequentialism tells us about this is that we should be strongly disposed to help non-human animals. Uh, individual animals suffering from natural causes because we must move forward to a, a society in which increasing numbers of people uh, study research how to better help non-human animals, how to intervene in nature in order to uh, alleviate or even prevent the natural harms they suffer. And has um, Pablo um, Gav Gavallo, oh, I Pedro, Pedro, Pe Pedro Gavallo, has he had the opportunity to respond to your work? Well, I know he's familiar with it and... Uh, in fact, um, uh, I could improve my my argument uh, uh, thanks to some of his comments, but um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to discuss it with him personally or have received some kind of reply by him. Though, of, of course, I would like the opportunity to uh, do so. And are there many rule consequentialists? Is it a popular f um, philosophical position? Do you think others might engage in this argument? Yes, um, uh, there are, there are, of course, there are many moral philosophers who are rule consequentialists, though, uh, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to write this uh, paper. Not, not many of them engage in animal ethics. Uh, of course, Brad uh, 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 Hooker, uh, uh, who is at the University of Reading and wrote in uh, 2000 the most important book on rule consequentialism, uh, Consequentialism, um, 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 in his book, he, he, he says some things about non-human animals that, of course, they, they must be included in our moral deliberation, but it, but, but it doesn't delve too much in that. And uh, I'm not aware of any other philosophical pieces on rule consequentialism and non-human animals apart from Pedro Galvaos and mine. So yeah, it is it is uh, a topic that uh, merits further exploration from a rule consequentialist point of view, certainly. Hmm. Well, uh, philosophers listening, you've heard the call, the gauntlet that's been thrown down. What do you? How do you respond? Now, Izzy, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I hope I am. <laughs> Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Yeah, uh, I think I do. I think it was uh, uh, Jeff McMahon's arguments against speciesism in his uh, The Ethics of Killing, Problems at the Margins of Life. Now, McMahon is uh, mm, 
a professor of moral philosophy at Oxford when he wrote this book. I think he was professor of moral philosophy at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And in that in that book, he he discusses different accounts of the badness of death and the wrongness of killing. Uh, uh, his main focus is uh, is the human fetus, but he talks a bit about non-human animals as well. It was the first time I came across the term speciesism and how it might be an unjustified form of discrimination. Mm, wonderful. Can you f- recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yeah, yeah, actually, I, I distinctly remember it. Uh, it was August uh, 2014, and it, it had been a few months since I submitted my PhD dis- dissertation, which had nothing to do with non-human animals, and uh, but, but I, I was eager to write about non-human animals. So um, an excellent colleague of mine and best, and best friend, Katia Faria, which I think uh, will, will be also interviewed for this podcast, suggested that we call it a small piece during, during, the, dur- during the summer, and we called it anthrop- Anthropocentrism and Speciesism, Conceptual and Normative Issues. Uh, and that, that was the first thing I wrote about non-human animals. Wonderful. So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Well, it, it is difficult for me to choose Charles one. I think you've, you, you will have to forgive me about this, since I met two of them at the same time, the very same day. Uh, I think that is an event which, which clearly de- determined the future of my academic career. I've, I've already named them. They are Oscar Orta, which is now the University of Santiago de Compostela, and of course, Katia. Uh, which is a colleague of mine at Minho and at the Center for Animal Ethics in Barcelona. And they are, they are great scholars, they are experts on, on wild animal uh, suffering, they are truly committed to making a better world for animals. And especially Katia, they convinced me uh, about the overwhelming importance of wild animals and that working on animal ethics is a high impact career. So it was clearly because of them. Wonderful. Both previous guests of Knowing Animals as well. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Well, I think that academics and philosophers especially are, we are uniquely trained in thinking carefully and uh, rigorously about moral problems. And also what we say has some degree of prestige in our societies. So we are in a privileged position to explain to our fellow c- citizens why the way we treat animals is so morally up- abhorrent. And we can encourage other ac- academics in the natural and social sciences to approach their research from a non species perspective. I think that this is perhaps the single most important thing we can do since it is necessary to obtain the knowledge and uh, technology necessary for improving the lives of animals, especially wild animals, who, as I said before, are the majority of sentient beings. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Well, I guess I will be repeating myself on this, but uh, I think it should be our perception of wild animals. And this is something even animal advocates and scholars fail to do, I think. Uh, to, To engage animals that live in nature as individuals with interests of their own, which we should consider. And we also fail to recognize all the facts, all the evidence that points to the prevalence of suffering in their lives. There are around a quintillion wild animals. As I said, they are the majority of sentient beings. And that means that most animals, that most sentient individuals, have lives of net suffering. I think that changing that is one of the best things we can do with our lives. Hmm. So what are you working on next? Well, I want to expand on the arguments in, in this paper we, we discussed, and I, I want to look more closely uh, to the implications of rural consequentialism regarding our o- obligations towards non-human animals, especially wild animals. And I think it is also important to know how other different rule-based moralities, such as the non-species kind of Kantism, Christian Korsgaard spouses and some contractualist accounts, may converge in this uh, respect and even how act consequentialism may converge with these theories at the level of our decision-making procedure. Um, I th- most morally considerable beings are non-human animals, not human beings, so 
agreement about what, what, what we owe to them is agreement about the better part of, of morality. So I think it is, uh, if that agreement can be strongly argued uh, for, that would not be trivial. And how can people find out more about your work? Well, pe people can just look me up at academia.edu and I also regularly engage on Facebook and Twitter so they can just search my name uh, and they can easily find me and my work. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us no, for Knowing Animals. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Now, you can follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals. You can also follow us on Facebook at Knowing Animals. And don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. We need some reviews for iTunes Spain. So people get reviewing. Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.